I, <clears throat> I now invite Rich Roy to come forward to light the chalice and lead us in our affirmation of covenant, which is in the order of service. Let us open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Let us open our minds to learn what is true. Let us open our hearts to love one another. Please join me now in our affirmation of covenant saying, Love is the doctrine of this church, the quest for truth is the sacrament, and service is the prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into the harmony of the divine mind. Thus do we covenant with each other. When we consider the condition of our world, like every generation before us, we must puzzle over a paradox. All in the human family want peace but we keep on waging war. By the title of this sermon, How to End War, I mean to suggest that there is a way to navigate that paradox so as to end war and build peace. We may never rid the world of war, but there is a way to end one when we are in it. The story of the Civil War's end in April of 1865 shows that way if we look closely. It is a commonplace of school book history that the Civil War ended when Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. That's not really true. Though Lee surrendered, it was still possible for the war to go on. Indeed, Lee did not have to surrender. There was another option, and Jefferson Davis was pressing him to take it. That option was guerrilla war. All our military leaders, North and South, would have known about guerrilla warfare. The word guerrilla was coined to name the strategy the Spanish used to resist Napoleon in the early 19th century. Bands of saboteurs and raiders sprang up in one region of Spain after another. Until they struck, they were invisible. A priest, a student, a shepherd, anyone might be part of such a band. Early small victories encouraged more such groups to form, and they struck with increasing conviction and audacity. Today, we are calling these sort of groups terrorist cells. The Spanish guerrillas bogged down three of Napoleon's armies at one point. Napoleon called them his Spanish ulcer. Jefferson Davis talked about them a lot. And before the word guerrilla was coined, there had been plenty of examples of similar tactics used in European wars, from the Thirty Years' War to the Dutch Revolt. Guerrilla tactics had even been used against the British in the American Revolution. Such tactics were neither unknown nor foreign to American military leaders. Lee's own father had used them. Lee and his army might have simply melted into the woods and disappeared. Joe Johnston might have done the same with his army in North Carolina. Nathan Bedford Forrest and his forces might have dispersed into the back country of Alabama or Mississippi or Tennessee or made their way to Texas, as many Southern civilians were doing. The Southern armies were no longer strong enough to defeat the North on the battlefield, but as a stealthy guerrilla strike force, they would have been formidable. They knew the country, they were organized, disciplined, and they were devoted to their leaders. They could have lasted for years. Think of the entire South and eventually our whole country 
mired in such violence, terror, and struggle. It was possible. It was already happening in Missouri. Missouri is where I grew up, except for my elementary school years when we lived in Ohio. In high school, I took the Missouri Constitution test required for graduation and learned about Missouri history. But I never learned any local history about the Civil War. Never mentioned was the name of William Clark Quantrill, the raider who touched off Missouri's guerrilla war. In 1862, less than a year after the surrender of Fort Sumter, Quantrill began a series of attacks into Kansas that brought life there to a standstill. Then in 1863, he led a raid on Lawrence, Kansas, stronghold of Union sympathizers, haven for runaway slaves, and headquarters to the Red Legs, a band of Unionist guerrillas. The town was looted and burned and its residents massacred. It made headlines around the world. In retaliation, the Federal Army poured into four adjacent counties in Missouri and depopulated them, deported almost every resident, burned their homes, destroyed their crops in order to deprive Quantrill of his base of support. It quickly became a vicious cycle of retaliation and revenge. By 1864, harassment of civilians, robbery, and sabotage were daily events. Not content simply to kill the enemy, each side mutilated and sometimes scalped their victims. The mutilation escalated. Quantrill and his men collected trophies. They hung scalps on their horses' bridles, as well as ears, noses, teeth, fingers. Federal soldiers adopted guerrilla tactics too, stalking Missouri to torment, torture, and kill Southern sympathizers. More bands of rebel guerrillas rose up to retaliate in kind against Unionist sympathizers. Normal life disappeared in Missouri. No one was safe. No one was safe. Trains, stage lines, even steamboats were attacked. Missouri became a gauntlet for them. Small towns became fortified islands in a sea of death. The fabric of civil society was torn apart and moral standards disintegrated. It was a war without fronts, without boundaries, without formal organization, and no division between civilians and soldiers. It was sheer anarchy and terror. Ever wonder where some of those famous Western outlaws came from? Would you be surprised to learn that among William Quantrill's men was one Jesse James? We didn't learn about Missouri's guerrilla terror in school. I think Missouri did not want to remember its trauma. We did learn about Jesse James, but he seemed like a strange, isolated phenomenon. He was no such thing. He just held on to the wartime status quo a little longer than the rest. This chaos in Missouri was unfolding as Lincoln stood on the Gettysburg battlefield in November of 1863 and gave his now famous address. It is what he meant when he suggested that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, might perish from the earth. This terror is what Jefferson Davis was calling for in April of 1865 as Lee was retreating from Grant in Virginia and Johnston was getting ready to face Sherman in North Carolina. It wasn't a war for slavery anymore. Lee had asked for, and the Confederate Congress had granted, slave regiments with the provision that slave soldiers would be freed after the war. By April of 1865, northern and southern leaders agreed that slavery was dead. All that was left to Davis was the goal of southern independence. He thought that goal could be won, was worth winning, by grinding away at the north in a protracted guerrilla conflict. Lee thought differently. 
He said he would rather die a thousand deaths than surrender to Grant. But the only alternative was this terror that Davis was calling for. Rather than turn his home state, his country, into another Missouri, when Grant's letter came asking him to surrender, he sent a reply asking what terms Grant would offer. The dialogue was opened. Grant asked for an end to hostilities. Lee suggested they meet to discuss a more general peace. As the restoration of peace should be the sole object of all, he wrote, I desire to know whether your proposals would lead to that. Grant agreed to meet and asked Lee to name the place and time, a very generous conciliatory gesture, the victor allowing the vanquished to choose the place and time of his surrender. Grant was resolved to strip Lee's army of weapons, but not to destroy their dignity. That is what Lincoln wanted. Lincoln kept telling his generals, his cabinet, and the people that it mattered how the war ended. That after the fighting would come the hard, disciplined work of reconciliation, which must be begun immediately in order to preserve freedom in the coming peace. He told his generals to pursue the war forcefully, but to pursue the peace when it might come, gently and with respect. So Grant strove to fulfill Lincoln's wishes. He let Lee choose the place and time of their meeting. His terms were generous. He required the surrender of all weapons that were public property, but allowed officers to keep their sidearms, horses, and baggage, which would have been their personal property. He allowed the Southern soldiers to return to their homes, not to be disturbed so long as they obeyed the laws. When Lee asked for rations for his men, Grant gave them liberally. Grant's example inspired other generous and respectful gestures from his men. The officer in charge of the surrender ceremony, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, spontaneously ordered his men to give a salute of honor as the Confederates turned in their weapons. To be sure, tensions ran high and hatreds ran deep in many of the men on both sides. But these gestures mattered. The Southerners might have been mocked and humiliated, even tortured or hung. Instead, they were shown the highest signs of courtesy and respect. The surrender at Appomattox took place on Palm Sunday. On Good Friday, five days later, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Both Northern and Southern leaders saw this as a calamity, for all feared what would happen without his moderating influence in Washington. Worse, his Vice President, Andrew Johnson, was known to be much more hostile to the South and thought less likely to pursue Lincoln's conciliatory goals. The Union government was still in confusion as Sherman closed in on Johnston's army in North Carolina. Contrary to his orders from Jefferson Davis to fight on, to convert to guerrilla tactics, Johnston sent Sherman a letter asking to meet with him to discuss terms, as he put it, of exterminating the existing war. Like Grant, Sherman allowed his opponent to choose the place and time of meeting, and when they met, Sherman informed Johnston of Lincoln's death. Johnston denied that the Confederate government was behind it, and Sherman chose to believe him. How could they know for sure? It was a choice by Sherman. Then Johnston proposed a universal surrender that he and Sherman settle the fate of all the armies to the Rio Grande. At a second meeting three days later, Sherman presented a very generous, comprehensive peace agreement 
Confederate armies were to disband, surrender their arms at their respective state capitals in the state arsenals. Federal courts were to be reestablished, and as soon as the existing state governments took loyalty oaths, they were to be recognized by the U.S. president, all citizens to be guaranteed their political rights. Sherman had no authority to make such a peace, and he knew it. So all this was subject to the approval of superior authorities on both sides, but the vision of it and the respect and courtesy embodied in its terms outshone Grant in magnanimity. Back in Washington, Andrew Johnson and his cabinet were furious at Sherman for over so overstepping his authority, and when they learned what he had proposed, they sent Grant to take over his command and negotiate Johnston's surrender. Grant went less to replace Sherman than to stand by him. Sherman's comprehensive peace proposal was withdrawn, but Sherman remained in command of his army. Several days later, Sherman offered terms similar to those Grant had given Lee. Like Grant, he offered rations to Johnston's army and made sure his men treated Southerners with respect and kindness. With Johnston's surrender, the remaining Confederate commanders followed suit. Respect, courtesy, and generosity were what made peace come so quickly. The horrors of the war, not least the terrible prospect of an all-out guerrilla war that could last for generations, motivated the generals on both sides to choose peace and to show each other respect, courtesy, and generosity in making peace. And they knew that had they chosen a guerrilla war, respect and courtesy and generosity themselves would have been destroyed. Better to guard and use those sacred values, to appreciate them and preserve them by living them while they still had them. One last story. We know that it took another hundred years to secure basic civil rights for the descendants of the enslaved. And during those 10 decades, institutions and a whole mythology, the lost cause narrative, developed to forestall any effort toward equality and equity. At St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia, once called the Cathedral of the Confederacy, the lost cause found expression in stained glass. Two pairs of windows were installed in the 1890s, one set depicting Jefferson Davis as a holy martyr, the other set depicting Robert E. Lee as Moses. Lee was long in his grave by that time. He died in 1870. But his image had had a generation to wander in cultural memory from the truth of the man and to become a lost cause icon installed in this and many other churches and other kinds of public spaces. It took a long time to roll back the lost cause story and the Jim Crow re regime that it empowered. But one of the first gestures in that struggle was made in Richmond late in the spring of 1865 in that very church before the windows were put in. It was Sunday morning and the minister of St. Paul's was about to serve communion. The tradition in that church for years had been that whites received communion first, then blacks. But unexpectedly, a tall, well-dressed black man came forward first and knelt to receive communion. congregation froze, stunned, surprised, horrified. The minister was embarrassed and hesitated, not knowing what to do. Then a white man in the congregation rose, 
and approached the communion rail with quiet dignity and self-possession. He knelt beside that black man to receive communion with him. With a mixture of reluctance, fear, and hope, others in the congregation slowly followed his example. The white, man who came, the white man who came forward first to kneel beside that black man, that was Robert E. Lee. Respect, courtesy, generosity, and courage. That's what it takes to end war. That's what it takes to build peace. It isn't accomplished in a day and may not be for a decade or a century or more, but there comes to each of us the moment to decide. And there come moments when we must rededicate ourselves to the unfinished work. And there come times when we may take satisfaction from duty faithfully performed, from constancy and devotion to the right as we are given to see the right. Now, even now, when we live under a government so riven that state legislatures attack whole classes of citizens and while the federal legislature meanwhile struggles even to organize itself and wars rage on abroad, still we have opportunities to end war, create peace, and build back a better world where justice shall roll down like waters and peace like an ever-flowing stream. Let us work for that goal, with respect, courtesy, generosity, and courage. So may it be. Amen. I invite Rich Roy back up to extinguish our chalice. Which I shall do symbolically. <laughs> <laughs> Please join in saying our closing words, which are in the order of service. Go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all beings. And may respect, courtesy, generosity, and courage bring us peace. Amen.